this is where the iterative and recursive elements are important because memory is encoded in us and we have physical memory. We have, we, we, we have to remember how to walk and how to talk. These, <laughs> okay. are, these are memory activities. Right, yeah. These aren't, these aren't decisions. Uh-huh. You know, the way that you learn to tie your shoes. Yeah. When you think about it, it's a very, very complex thing and you don't learn to do it overnight. Welcome to Stuff You Can't Say with Jazz Piano, one Aussie musician's leash-free zone for unruly opinions. This is Emma Stevenson. Today I bring you the first interview of this podcast. My guest is the multi-award-winning Australian trumpeter and composer Phil Slater. The excerpt that you are listening to right now is from the track titled Crest by the Phil Slater Quartet on the album The Thousands, featuring Matt McMahon on piano, Lloyd Swanton on bass, and Simon Barker on drums. Phil has performed and recorded with a diverse range of artists, including Nigel Kennedy, Lou Reed, Missy Higgins, Vince Jones, Katie Noonan, Jim Black, and the Australian Art Orchestra. He has performed with both the Sydney Theatre Company and Company B Productions and has featured as a soloist on several soundtracks including the movies Candy, Me, Myself, I and Sample People and the TV series Wildside and Grassroots. In 2004, Phil was awarded the Bell Award for Australian Jazz Musician of the Year and in 2002, he was the Music Council of Australia Friedman Fellowship winner. In 2003, Phil won the National Jazz Award at the Wangaratta Jazz Festival. Phil was a lecturer of mine at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. In addition to being an incredible musician, he's also very insightful and interesting to speak to about music. Today we spoke about practice-led research, which he and I are currently engaged in at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. This is the first of two interviews I have conducted on the topic of practice-led research. The other is with Simon Barker, who is my current supervisor, And that interview will be released concurrently with this one, so you can listen to them back to back if you're really interested in this topic. We conducted this interview at the Conservatorium, and so you will hear the predictable background noises of people practicing in the distance, etc. I did my best to reduce the noise as much as possible, but I'm sure listeners will forgive the ambience of the situation. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Okay, I'm here with Phil Slater. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Phil. Um, Pleasure to be here. So as listeners will know by now, we are here loosely to talk about um, practice-led research, although I'm sure we'll get into other areas um, from that. So I just want to start by asking you if you could loosely define, as you see it, what practice-led or practice-based research is. Yeah. Well, I think before we define what the research part of it is, I think it's probably more helpful to start with trying to define what the practice part of that phrase is. So for me, um, and presumably for you too, like that centers around music and the creation of music. So if I think about what I do um, on a day-to-day basis to maintain my, my career or my practice as a musician, it involves um, uh, various activities. Uh, I'm a trumpet player, so a certain amount of, you know, every day is dedicated to um, pedagogical study, so maintaining technical things on the instrument or exploring technical things that are really about playing the instrument. Um, And some of those will have a historical basis. Um, I mean, I'm interested in jazz trumpet playing, so there are uh, precedences as as to how that has been done in the past, and I'm interested in how um, past trumpet players have developed or invented or discovered the techniques that they use, Um, and I try to work out what skills are required to to do those instrumentally. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
that's sort of apart from aesthetics. That's really just nuts and bolts, me playing, me being an instrumentalist and learning to play the instrument. Um, then there's the um, aesthetic side of it. So trying to work out um, what, to, what to play, being an improviser and being a creative musician, I'm always trying to create music that I think is original or at least somehow reflects you know, my existence and the life that I live. Um, and so that sort of element of the, if we call it the practice, um, involves all sorts of historical study, um, study of philosophy, study of, you know, conceptual underpinnings of trying to work out what it is that I think and feel about music. And, and yeah. part of my practice is performance. So um, I have to organise materials, organise um, associate artists to play with. So I consider part of the my sort of creative package to be band leading or ensemble leading and composing materials and organizing and arranging materials for the presentation of these ideas mm-hmm. that, that I have. So there are traditions in terms of that and there's like a whole, um, you know, there's a whole lifetime of study in terms of mm-hmm. playing with other musicians. And um, so already I've only really covered three things <laughs> and yet... You can see that um, in in you know in shorthand in a shorthand way of defining what I do as a practice, it's actually a pretty um, like there's a multitude of things that are involved yeah. um, and that are in a sense uh, you know they require and are justifiable through this idea of research, which mm-hmm. for me is about um, identifying a problem. Mm-hmm. And working out clear ways to articulate or solve or communicate responses to that problem. Sure. So I'm going to jump through to a question I was going to ask later in the yeah. interview, but it seems relevant now. So I guess most listeners will find it. It's not surprising that there's a lot of controversy within universities about like whether an artistic practice deserves the same sort of status and to be afforded the same respect as other forms of research. Like, for example, the one that always comes to mind is medical research. It's very important, obviously, to society as a whole. And, um, I mean, for me, I think it's certainly true that the way that those types of knowledge are utilised will be different in that they will have different societal outcomes. Um, But I think you could argue that the process involved in acquiring new knowledge is actually similar. There's quite a lot of universal parallels there. So I'm wondering, do you think that there are important differences between artistic practice and other forms of research? Big question. <laughs> okay, well, can I leave the artistic bit out? Yeah, Because sure. I think that if we redefine it to, to mean, is there are there different kinds of knowledge? Yes. And yes, there okay. are. You know, there's knowledge that we just know and there's knowledge that we experience and learn through doing something so if you you use the word process and maybe that's the way you're using it like uh. i do something and i learn from it and therefore knowledge evolves from yes. the doing aspect of whatever yeah. the activity is and i think that that's uh, you know it, it seems like an obvious thing doesn't it mm-hmm. um and i i think that you know, if we can agree that there are different kinds of knowledge and that knowledge comes in different forms, then it seems um, patently obvious that the knowledge that you get from playing the piano Mm -hmm. is as valid but different from the knowledge that I get from playing the trumpet. Not the knowledge that I get from playing the trumpet, but the knowledge I have about playing the trumpet. So, um, which I think those two are very different forms of knowledge as well. So, in terms of thinking about, you know, practical based or practice led research, <clears throat> what we're really talking about is just the creation of knowledge, yes. the creation, hopefully, of new knowledge and new understandings and new ways of understanding. Now, that raises the question, what are we understanding? And if we're understanding what it is that I do as a creative artist, then um I think that that sets up a whole, you know, interesting set of problems and questions that 
that I can set up a methodology to mm-hmm. try and answer. Now, if if the if the new understanding or the new knowledge new knowledge is really about the way that I think about Bach or the way that I think about Stravinsky or Miles Davis, then it's a different set of problems, different set of questions, and I need a different methodology, yes. which may or may not involve, you know, the the practice that we're talking about. Sure, sure. So. Uh, maybe I'll just approach these questions. I'm just going to play devil's advocate because <laughs> yeah. having having to explain to other people who aren't musicians how I how it came to be that I'm doing a PhD in jazz piano and how that's actually research has made me realize <laughs> what people's immediate responses are. And I think a lot of people would see the outcomes of um, an artistic process, if you see it as a form of research, so you're trying to acquire new knowledge um, that the type of knowledge you acquire can be quite, um, it's very personal and it, um, it's not necessarily immediately, immediately obvious how you put that to use in like a broader context. So, and my pushback is always, well, it means I can create better, for want of a better word, better art or new art, or I can come up with new ideas and it's going to deepen my process. And also it allows me, or it will eventually allow me to teach the things that I've learned. So there's like a pedagogical outcome as well. So I'm just wondering, like, what what has been your response when, if you've ever felt there's a bit of resistance to the whole concept of um, acquiring knowledge and whether it's actually a worthy practice through through being an artist? Well, I th- I actually think that you're doing more than what you just said that uh-huh. you're doing. <laughs> I think that part of what it is that you're doing is actually trying to answer pretty deep ontological problems, and by that sure. I mean you're trying to sort out what it is to be an artist today mm-hmm. and and more so what it means for you for you to be an artist today and i th- i think that th- those deep sort of metaphysical questions are actually uh, you know deeply important mm-hmm. questions that continually need addressing so your to use the word practice your practice um, as as a musician and as a as a as a pianist is also connected to this wider idea of how, you know, we define the field as being, for instance, an Australian jazz musician, how it is that you know what you know and what it is that you're creating, Mm. they have um, far wider implications than just your own practice. Mm -hmm. And so I think that your critics, um, you know, potentially are overlooking, um, you know, those, those deeper sort of ontological questions that you're hoping to to answer what what it is what it is that that you do what is the creative process for you and how does that relate to and communicate and um, articulate and understand what it is to be a, a creative artist today thank you i will try and be as eloquent as that when i'm talking to someone about this so just back on the topic of knowledge, so I wanted to delve a bit deeper there. So um, obviously, as you were saying, there are different types of knowledge. And one of the things I've heard you talk about a lot is this idea that, um, especially in universities and in the academic world, like linguistic forms of knowledge and sort of mind-based, like what can you talk about and how do you formulate a sentence that makes sense about certain concepts and that sort of knowledge. And um, I guess it all kind of, transpires into what can you write like what can you write a thesis about and how much do your words make sense Um, that sort of knowledge seems to be favored over this idea of embodied knowledge and the idea that um, artists musicians or everyone really has a certain level of knowledge that is actually contained within the body a memory of how to do things and I, I was wondering if you could expand upon that idea of embodied knowledge um once again, and this is like a pretty deep kind of ontological <laughs> area, um, what we know, um, how we know it, these sort of epistemological kind of questions are at the centre of what it is that we do. So I guess answering your question a little bit more specifically, I think it's, in, I think it's a vital component of research that... Um, that problems and outcomes are articulated and communicated. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's an absolutely essential, probably the essential 
you know, feature of any research is the communication of ideas. So what we're talking about and what you're talking about is maybe the preferencing of, you know, semantic knowledge, like the way that we use language to explain phenomena. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we all know patently that there are lots of phenomena in the world that mm-hmm. aren't language based, you know, mm-hmm. so um, and music tends to be one of them. So this raises the question, can can music have the same weight in terms of communicating ideas as the written or the spoken word. And I think that maybe this is um, an area where people find contentious. But of course, musicians, particularly performing musicians, would say, of course, that Mm. music, not Mm. only is music about thought, music is thought. Yeah, it's obvious. It's obvious to someone who does it. Yeah, yeah. that that yeah. and the way that the the way that our brains work when we um, are playing music is proven to be different from the way that our brains work when then when we're talking. So once again, it comes down to a little bit of a preferential system being set up that one component of brain activity is more relevant than another mm-hmm. and. I think, you, you know, neuroscientists would probably find that hard to, to you know... To justify? Or? Well, to support, you yeah. know, that we're, what we're talking about is, is one set of, you know, communication over the other um, and really the, the preferencing of, of like, semantic sure. knowledge. Sure. So I'm wondering if you... Do you see the knowledge in a way as actually being in the music so like for example as improvising musicians we've all sort of had that compliment not even necessarily from someone who doesn't play music but maybe someone who doesn't create music in the same way that we do through through improvisation the comment oh my gosh it's so amazing how you guys just make that all up like and in a way that question can sometimes indicate that the person asking it doesn't necessarily uh understand like the depth of practice that's actually gone into getting to the point where you can just quote unquote spontaneously create music. So I'm wondering if you see like the outcomes of, of research in this way, the knowledge is actually communicated through the music more than the thesis that you might write um, alongside your PhD, you know, so you might create a body of work as well as write a thesis and the knowledge is as much if not more in the actual, the music that you're making. If I could maybe funnel this towards, you know, the outcomes that we're talking about of the research or of the practice uh, are, um, you know, particularly in our, you know, the methodology that we use is based in improvisation and Mm. um, and it's performative. By performative, we perform the (laughs) the outcomes. Yeah, okay. The outcomes emerge through the act of the performance. Now, okay. if, I, if I can sort of redefine or, or kind of broaden what I mean by performance. Yes, please. And I think yeah. that um, we often f- fall into this trap in, and it's all definitions and, you know, semantics, but performance for me is not a performance. It's not a final um, rendering of an idea. Okay. The performance is the practice. It's an evolving part of the... Well, if I, if I talk about practice in terms of it being iterative and recursive, so iterative, iterative and recursive, it's repeating. Okay. My practice, the way that I practice and the way that I develop skills, maybe this is what you refer to when you talked about process, is much much in the same way that we learn any sort of skill mm-hmm. you 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 do it a bit mm-hmm. and then the next day you come back and you do it a bit yeah. and then the next day you come back and you do it a bit and the way that the brain's working is that it's taking small discoveries small mm-hmm. understandings small elements of memory and combining it with the new day's practice does that right, make sense? Okay. So yeah. it's totally reliant upon not me thinking something and being able to do it. Yeah. It's reliant upon me in an iterative way, so in a repetitive way, uh-huh. 
um, doing certain drills or doing certain, you know, a methodology that's undertaken over a period of time. And over that period of time, my understandings, they shift and they kind of accrete, they grow, they, they accumulate, things emerge out of it. It's almost, I don't want to use the word ritualistic, but it has this element of a repetitive element to it that seems to unlock things, thoughts, sort of thought patterns, memory things in my own head. And the performance is part of that. Or not the performance, but performance is part of that. Little p performance. So it's performative in that I am performing a task. Now, that task could be me um, practicing a certain drill in a reflexive way. What do you mean by reflexive? In that I'm conscious of and aware of and being sensitive to any shifts or changes that occur in the way that Mm. I think or feel in terms of, you know, in terms of body response to the way that Remember, we're talking about music, and music, in a sense, is feel. Hearing is feel. Mm -hmm. Um, What I'm talking about is sensory input. So the way that something feels to me um, is something that becomes memory in 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 the part of my brain that maps out my body. And so this is where the iterative and recursive elements are important because memory is encoded in us, and we have physical memory. We have we 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 have to remember how to walk and how to talk. These <laughs> okay. are these are memory activities. Right. Yeah. These aren't these aren't decisions. Uh-huh. You know the way that you learn to tie your shoes. Yeah. When you think about it, it's a very very complex thing, and you don't learn to do it overnight. It takes time. Yeah. Even though you think when you when you look back, you can't remember how much time it took you to learn that skill. Exactly. You're not aware of it at the time. So um so this idea of repeated doings for me is a crucial element of you know the, the performing artist and yeah. the performing creative artist I, I should um maybe also sub define what it is about practice for me practice for me is not about achieving perfection or mm-hmm. about achieving any sort of rendering of another person's music yeah the practice for me is an is exploration So this seems like a good time to let you all know that you can donate to this podcast by heading to patreon.com slash Emma Grace Stevenson. After recouping my minimal administration costs, my goal in collecting donations is to raise money for the top charities listed at givewell.org, to whom all profits will be directed on a quarterly basis. By donating to the podcast, you are helping me to build my brand as well as making the world a better place for those that need it most. If you'd like to support me directly, you can do so by purchasing my music. Head to emmagracestevensonmusic.com and click on the music page. Because what you're saying, especially with the idea of tying your shoelaces and how you have to do it every day, you have to make mistakes, you have to fix those mistakes. And this all kind of happens at a young age when you're not really conscious of the process. But then as an adult trying to, um, to integrate a new skill, you would kind of have to undergo that process of repeatedly doing something um, every day. So how do you see learning how to improvise? I don't want to say it's probably not the right way to phrase the question, but you can elaborate versus maybe um, a more sort of classical approach to playing music where you're actually trying to skillfully reproduce movements kind of verbatim every time you do it. So, because what you're saying kind of sounds to me the way that a classical trumpet player might describe their practice as well. So what is the difference or what are some of the differences maybe? I think generally the way I think about it is that, um, you know, for want of a better term, a classical approach or a notated approach is is about rendering a score, mm, much yeah. in the same way that an actor renders the text, the, the written text. So... The role of the performer is to, um, you know, f- first and foremost, articulate the ideas of the composer, and hopefully, in doing so, reveal things that the composer may have not even thought of. Yeah. So it's certainly a dynamic approach. Yeah, um, and it is creative in a way. It's like, definitely creative. Yeah. Um, it's creative in the way that choreography is is creative in the way that, um, you know, a lot of what we think of in the arts is text-based in Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. 
it's about rendering a text, rendering an idea. The performer, in a sense, is the instrument of the co-creator or the creator of the text. Instrument meaning an extension of right. the composer. Yeah. But this is different from what I think that we do. We're actually a lot more closely aligned to sport or to conversation than okay. to um, than than to you know a notated classical or performance. I mean, I should say that I use a lot of notation in my music, so it's um, yeah, it's, and, yeah. It, and it's certainly maybe what I what you know the way we should be thinking about it is just in terms of you know. Um, creative contribution like mm-hmm. what and and can those things be sort of ratioed out you know in a in a percentage sense in a in an actual piece of music you're talking about or in or well well when when for instance an ensemble plays Bach what is the percentage of contribution made by the string quartet versus Bach okay. you know and I think that for me it's actually handy to think of it in, yeah, a, in yeah. that sense you know okay yeah um Let's face it, when we put in our app reforms or when you put in research outputs, the authorship of the work is of primary importance to the way that that work is understood by various institutions, not just academic institutions, financial institutions, you know, that, like mm-hmm. the, way that we, the way that income is generated is, is, is author-based. But um, so we're really talking about contribution and we're talking about... Um, why I think that we're kind of close, more closely or very closely aligned to sport is that I think that what we do relies upon the performance of the elements that we establish prior to the event. So in sport, you have um, you know a set of rules, you have a set of players, you have a time frame, you have, um, you know, a... a a kind of a teleological goal in that you know you know the aim of the game is to score more runs or score more goals than um, mm. your opponent and then the thing is set in motion and it's reactive reflexive it happens in the moment mm. it's a spontaneous rendering of the rules of the game and of strategy but it isn't pre it's not choreographed yeah. some moves some elements of it are choreographed obviously mm. tactically and strategically you know, things are set up, but there's room for agency, yeah. and the agency is in the the in the the sportsman. So, arguably, in improvisation, the the agency is in the performer, or similarly in the performer in the way that it is with the composer, sure. the creator of the the um, you know the ideas that are being rendered. Yeah. Well, I eventually I would like to get into what. Um, maybe you're specifically working on in your practice um, at the moment. So what you're, what you're moving towards, what your aims are. Um, but before we go there, <laughs> I know I'm asking the big, difficult, broad questions, but what you just said about the way that we set up a performance as, as improvising musicians, like when I try to define what jazz actually is these days even though I don't have a right to really define that nobody does but when I think of it what actually unifies everybody who calls himself a jazz musician um, it kind of comes down to the fact that you you wouldn't actually want a performance of a piece of music to be the same more than once you would want it to be different every time and you would also want it to be different if you were to ask different people to play in your ensemble so um, there's a certain it's kind of like an attitudinal component it's the way it's that we make music it's the approach it's the um yeah the attitude that we have to making music and the fact that we see merit in individual self-expression and improvisation and in not planning everything out and it not being sort of rigid um but other than that i don't i don't know if i personally really see any sort of unifying stylistic or sound based components to jazz nowadays and i think that um the public perception of what jazz music is probably doesn't necessarily align with that. I think that there's a lot of assumptions about what jazz is supposed to sound like. And um, a lot of it is based on sort of like 40s and 50s kind of traditional ensembles. So I'm wondering, I know it's a big question, but what what exactly do you think defines jazz as an art form nowadays in the 21st century? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
No, I think it's actually a really great question that we should ask ourselves all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. w- because it, because it is a problem. Yeah. And yeah. and it's a helpful problem because uh-huh. we have to constantly these things constantly need addressing and need remaking and you know, if, if something's if this is the ritualistic element of things in our culture, if it's if it's worthwhile, it needs to be redone over and over again. Um so if we talk about jazz not necessarily as a style but as a way of working, a, a way of working musically, you know, we need to look at where, once again, I'll use this word agency, where is the creative agency in, in, a, in a jazz, in a performance of music that's loosely called quote-unquote jazz? The agency is in the performer. The performer, more or less within, the gui- within certain guidelines, is free to interpret, free to change, free to adapt, free to perform, free to understand the music in whatever way that they see fit. So once again, this ratio of agency is much higher in a jazz ensemble than in a, in a, in a, in a classical ensemble. And that's not necessarily... Um, and I'm talking about the performance element. I'm mm-hmm. not talking about the creation of the ideas because arguably <laughs> if you're... If you're if you're you know playing in a in a very sort of defined um, historical way in a jazz ensemble, then arguably you have less agency because a lot of the stylistic tendencies that you will use are um, predetermined. Right, you got to play those um, that language. Is that if, what you mean? If you want, it, yeah. If you want something to sound like it, sound like something you need to follow the stylistic rules that were prevalent when that thing was made um so arguably the ratio of agency is changed in that instance yeah yeah if you're trying to um conform to a certain style yeah agency for me means freedom freedom to choose what to do freedom to 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 coordinate yourself within not only a stylistic sort of language but in a personal language with the musicians you're playing with so for me, um, and I'm, I, I can really only talk about the music that I perform yeah, and play, but course. I feel that, um, you know, I feel free to, um, for the music that, that, that I make and that the ensembles that I play and make, I feel that it, it can go in lots of different directions mm-hmm. at any given moment. And that's the thing that I find compelling about doing it that I never actually know what it is that is going to occur until the performance. So the performance or the performative element of the music making is the text. It is the thing that is of most interest uh-huh. in terms of um, understanding what it is that, that, I, that I do. The research element of it is the preparation that I do to sure. get to that place. Okay. And, but yet you would still consider the actual moment of performance, any performance, as very much a part of your research. Oh, as, it's, yeah. it's, it's definitely, it's the, it's the, it's the communication element yes. of the knowledge. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Cool. Well, that's, that's a great way to get us into my last question, which is just, I was wondering if you could just talk about what you're specifically working on as your quote unquote practice led research at the moment. So, um, yeah, getting right down, I mean, imagine that there are, some trumpet players listening right now so as specific as you like okay so the trumpet's interesting to me historically um it's interesting to me in terms of the way you know the genealogy of the instrument the fact that it started as this thing that was about communication and about not just communication but about conquering space Mm -hmm. and place and the way that it was able to you know, strategically be used to organize communities. Like, mm-hmm. I find that fascinating about the instrument. And I think that there's something about the instrument that's, uh, that that historical element is, is in the instrument when it's played. Um, when you say organize communities, can you give some examples? Of- okay, so we're here and those guys are attacking us. And so if you <laughs> go over to that hill there, we can stay in touch because I've got uh, this thing okay. that's louder than the voice. Yep. And we can organize our community to defend or we can organize our community to attack. Uh-huh. We can use 
you know, this instrument to place someone, to situate them in space, in geography. Um, we can, we use the instrument, um, and in terms of, the, once again, the genealogy of the instrument, the instrument was central to religious and secular territory uh-huh. establishing that often territories were set out to the range of a trumpet. <laughs> um, That's amazing. So I find that a kind of an interesting, like a media studies kind of uh-huh. um, element that, that the instrument um, has that sort of space relationship. It's almost like a spatial, um, a spatial instrument. More than a musical, more than pleasure. It's uh-huh. about something deeper than pleasure. It's about the way that we understand space. Um, so I'm interested in that. Um, I'm also I- interested in. Um, I'm interested in the way that space, connected to this idea of the trumpet being a spatial instrument, um, uh, Australian jazz has a problematic relationship to place. I, I think, uh-huh. in that. Um, conceptually the concept of place and maybe more specifically this idea of landscape that is so prevalent in other art forms in um, you know internationally but if I confine it just to Australia mm-hmm. the way that our artists our colleagues in other art forms have kind of understood what it is that they do um, there tends to be more um, focus upon place and the landscape in the way that they construct and think of the works, but almost more importantly, or certainly as importantly, the way that those works have been understood more broadly in, you know, the discourse of Australian identity. Wow. So I think that, um, you know, what I'm you know, curious about is this idea of asking the question, um, you know, can, can an Australian jazz practice reflect place and landscape? And so my main sort of mode of inquiry is trying to separate what's, what's considered to be sort of moral or ethical questioning, mm-hmm. i.e. should we be doing this and can you even play this, you know, music in Australia and um, is music, is this music an American art form and are we just importing cultures and that sort of moral, <laughs> moral ethical area. Yeah. Separating that from um, a more metaphysical line of inquiry around um, modal questioning. And by that I mean, is it actually possible to make music that has sense of place? Right. An Australian form of jazz in a way? Or? Well, in my, in my instances it is because I live in Australia. So yeah, it it, ontologically it's... I'm, I can really only talk about my own <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm trying to set up projects to explore the, this, this idea of this, um, a, a modal line of, in, uh, of, of inquiring the possibility of even doing it, not whether or not we should or shouldn't be doing it, but sure. is it even possible? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I'm aware that we're running out of time, so you feel free to... We can uh, save this for another interview if you like. But what you just said reminded me of another time I was, um, I think it was in a third year class I had with you, you mentioned this idea of cultural cringe that Australians have. And I, I'd love to talk about that at some point. Uh, we can save it for the next if you'd like. Sure. Or cover it now. Sure. Up to you. So um, could you, first of all, if for those that don't haven't heard this term, cultural cringe, just maybe explain what it is. And secondly, um, whether or not you feel that Australians are particularly uh, victims of it or perpetrators of it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> I mean, all cultures are, and and what you know, more broadly speaking, we're talking about this idea of otherness, and we're talking about concepts of um, um, nativism. You know, the, that yeah. that only certain cultures can produce content f- um, that's reflective of that culture. So, mm. these are, um, you know core core features of any sort of jazz practice i think uh-huh. more broadly speaking in australia this idea of the cultural cringe or you know the flip side of it the cultural strut which is um, uh, i which haven't is, heard that one <laughs> ah well i can't cite where it's from but um 
it's the um, the other side of the same coin. So uh -huh. cultural cringe is this idea of things being of more value if they're from outside. Mm. Cultural strut is this is Australian and this is the best. So this kind of nativistic approach to yeah. It doesn't sound particularly products. Australian, to be honest, that last sentence. I, uh, it's it's, um, it's um, all forms of, you know, racial intolerance and, um, you know, they all have this kind of notion of, um, you know, our foreign policy. That's all part of this idea of, um, you know, it's embedded in the politics of today. Uh-huh. Interesting. Cool. Um, well... It's been super interesting talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be my first interview guest. <laughs> I hope we can do it again about some other topic. Yeah. Um, until next time. Thanks, Emma. Thanks to Phil Slater. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Phil Slater. The track you are hearing now is Burden of Corners, also by the Phil Slater Quartet, on the same album, The Thousands, from 2008, featuring Matt McMahon on piano, Lloyd Swanton on bass, Simon Barker on drums, and of course, Phil on trumpet. Phil's Twitter handle is at Phil underscore Slater if you'd like to connect with him in the future. You can purchase this album on iTunes. If you enjoyed this podcast, the absolute best thing you can do right now is to share it with others who you think might enjoy. The next best thing is to rate it on iTunes. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. If you'd like to get in contact, you can head to my website. It's emmagracestevensonmusic.com and just head straight to the contact page. Thank you very much for listening. You know what else you can do to support this podcast? You can just go to Facebook and search for my page, Emma Grace Stevenson, that's Stevenson with a PH, and click like. And then you can head over to Twitter. My handle is at Emma G Stevenson and follow me there. And that way you're granting me the privilege to keep communicating with you about this podcast, about my blog, and about other things that are going on in my creative life. So if you'd be so kind, I will see you in Cyberland.